Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I get your attention, please? My name is Frank Algo from the University of Stuttgart, and I have the pleasure of introducing today's plenary speaker to you, which is uh, Professor Karl Kunisch from the Department of Mathematics at the uh, Karl Franzens University in Graz. Um, let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Kunisch to those of you who don't know him, which is probably not too many among you. Um, he got his uh, his uh, university education also in Graz, but at the other university there, at the Technical University, where he went through all the different stages of, uh, of the university education, but a little un unusual up to the professor level at the, the university. Then he had a short, uh, a short time as a professor in Germany at the Technical University in Berlin, and also a short time uh, in the United States. And before he came back, already quite a number of years ago to Graz, but now to the other university, to the Karl Franzens University. He's a very well known in the field. He is editor of or on the editorial board of 14 journals, just imagine that. I don't want to know how much work you have uh, with all that, of 14 journals. He's also engaged in many, many other things. Uh, he received many awards for his work, uh, most recently and most notably an ERC uh, advanced grant, which for those of you who are not in Europe is something really very big, very competitive, and also a lot of work then afterwards to uh, to spend the money you are getting for, for that award. Um, his research um, is in the, on the mathematical side of control theory, um, mostly on optimization, optimal control, um, but really looking at everything from numerics to, um, to the Im implementation aspects, maybe not at real plans, but also at issues that are of relevance to, to practice. Today's talk he will be on also on optimal control, but he will look at, well, not the zero-dimensional systems, uh, but partial differential equations he will look at. And uh, he will also look at sparsity constraints, so two interesting concepts that are added to the regular optimal control side. So, Professor Kunisch, we are very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Professor Algoer. Thank you very much to the team of Professor Del Rey, who has invited me here and who has taken care of me so well since I changed my hotel reservation several times and so on. Actually, I have a big advantage over all of you. I have been here long before any one of you. I have been here before even the university was built. Um, but the pond was here, and I was a child, and it was a nice playground for me. Um, now looking at, in this case, first at the icons, um, there is an icon of the Department of Mathematics at Graz, and there is an icon of the Radon Institute uh, of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, which he is here at Linz. And there are two group, there are groups of people, young groups of people, groups of people, young people working with me, and I really appreciate this uh, situation. Now, to partially set the stage, let us look at the grandmother or grandfather of many optimal control problems. So simply, the dynamical systems for the time being set in finite dimensional spaces, x dot equal ax plus bu with an initial condition x zero. Some tracking to some desired state z and some cost term, which is quadratic here. The time horizon is denoted by t infinity. It's not the focus of the talk here. It can be finite or infinite. The focus of the talk is this term here, the cost on the control. And there are many good reasons to choose it as I have chosen it here. Linear quadratic regulator theory, linear quadratic Gaussian, formulations, statistics, or if you are thinking of computations, I mean, it's nice to have a 
this term because it's easy to take a first derivative and a second derivative and all the derivatives you want. Sure. Well, I also put on constraints here. You. That's not too much the focus. The focus, as I said, is this term. Then there's also a fact. Once you put on this term, and alpha is positive, and you look at the optimality system, the system which characterizes the minimizer, u star, then there is a relationship between this minimizer and the adjoint state. The terminology adjoint state will appear over and over again during my talk. It is the adjoint state also satisfies a differential equation like this one, but it's running backwards in time, and you need to, so there's a minus in front, and you need to replace A by A transpose in finite dimensions and by the adjoint in infinite dimensions. But this adjoint, as I said, also satisfies a differential equation, the equation. So it has some regularity. It has extra regularity over just being the L2. It's at least W12. It's at least differentiable in some sense, even after projection. So in spite of the fact that your original formulation was taking the control as an L2 function, which would allow jumps, the optimal control doesn't contain these jumps anymore, at least not in this situation, if you have a regularization term there or a penalty. So there is, now you may like this or not like this, but this is a structural fact. My focus, as already has been pointed out, is more the PDE side. So I replace the ordinary differential equation by an abstract PDE here. All the time you may think of the operator A is minus Laplacian, so it's a diffusion equation. Or maybe also some convection inside. There's a uh, control operator B. There is some term realizing the state. I'm always thinking here in terms of tracking type functionals. So I'm tracking over the domain omega and over the time interval zero to t my state to the target by choosing an adequate control u. Here is the term in red. Here is the term that I'm focusing on. And I'm not necessarily taking it as an L2 function. Rather, for the time being, I focus on this functional here. I didn't forget the square. I don't mean the square. And there are several good reasons for doing that. Think of it this morning when getting up. I mean, your target was clear, right? To have breakfast, to come over here. But the first seconds, you know, this, this, the quadratic, you had no control, right? You're just getting up. So you need a lot of energy at the beginning, I think, at least myself. And then I go to the talk, and during the talk, I, I relax a little bit, right? So my cost is more like the square root, almost, right? But then there are the technical slides. All of a sudden, it becomes cubic, maybe, right? So the square is something we get so used to from the lectures, and then we teach it. But then we should, and then it's very useful. And then there is so much software for it. But here, I'm really taking a second look at it and say, well, we have spent a lot of time on modeling the partial differential equation. We have made a decision on the tracking here. And actually, I should also, from a statistical point of view, be very interested in using different choices here. Very, but I'm, focus, I'm, not, I'm leaving this aside today. I focus on this term. So there are reasons for doing that. And uh, maybe I should first say, we have, we have computed a little bit. And so we, we did a computation with all kinds of different tests, with all kinds of different control, cons, uh, control penalties. Where is it? Here. 
So we were tracking an elliptic equation by a control to some target. I didn't show you the target here. It looks a little bit like this, but more regular. But what I'm showing you is the optimal control as a function of different control penalties, control costs. So there's, first I choose it as a quadratic over the domain omega. So this is minus Laplacian on a domain omega, and I'm tracking to some target. And this is the optimal control. So it's smooth. We replaced the square by the power of one. And the optimal control, the optimal control is significantly different. And yes, you may say it depends on the parameter alpha. Correct. But even if you change alpha in a wide range, it still has these features. It's not close to zero in this region. It is zero in this region. Zero in this region. But then it needs more energy in those terms where it's non-zero on the support. Then you need more energy. Yes, that's right. And since we are we're already coding, so we test, we cho chose other functionals, like, for example, the gradient of u. So if you are m more thinking in terms of ODE, you, you may think u with respect to t square. And it's really over-regularized. But that's the fact. But again, here we could delete this power 2 and look at what's happening if instead we take the power of 1 the control is close to being piecewise constant. Okay, that's a feature of this functional with no post-processing or a priori post-processing. Of course, if you want piecewise constant, you can do some post-processing. This is not the name of the game here. The name is what just does the functional do, and it really has a tremendous effect on the optimal control. All right, so f please follow me with a very short computation in dimension one. So simply there's a numbered set and you would like to choose a u such, a, such that u is close to z and you have a little bit of price to pay, alpha divided by two times u square. Alpha is positive. And you compute and you find the optimal u star. It's z divided by one plus alpha. So as we know, if alpha gets larger, you have a higher cost. Uh, so the optimal control gets smaller. No, no surprise, right? Now let's do a similar computation, only changing the power again. Okay. So and you, because it, there's this non-differentiable function, Lipschitz continuous plus non-smooth, we have to do a little bit of case study. Not significantly difficult, but just we have to do it. And we notice if the desired state, if the tracking term, if the image in image analysis is not sufficiently large, if it's small, then it doesn't pay off to even control anything. Then the formulation tells you, hold your horses to zero. Okay, if Z is... A, on the other hand, if Z is large, positive, then there is a control, U star, and if Z is negative, then there is the control on the other side. So, and it's, it's linear with respect to Z here. So there is a significant difference among the two. And part of this computation will intuitively reappear throughout my talk. Okay, this is really important, an important feature. Of course, you see some of the difficulties already arises. We are dealing, when it comes com to computations, with non smooth functions. And this, you say, well, but the lack of differentiability is just at one point, it's at zero. Yes, that's correct. But my optimal control is a function of time or time and space. So I don't know where this lack of differentiability occurs in my temporal or spatial domain. So I'm sort of talking about free boundary value problems, in, mathematically speaking. On the other hand, so this is the bad part of it. On the other hand, the good part is the lack of differentiability is not 
too difficult. It's still, the functional is still Lipschitzian. And that's good. So we can differentiate almost everywhere in some things like this. So motivation for sparsity. One thing is, is proportionality. So why should it be, all of, sometimes this quadratic term is related to energy, but not all the time. So why, if I'm going from Graz to Linz, my energy consumption is probably more or less proportional to the uh, distance, right? So prop the other one is in eliminate small con controls. Just get rid of them automatically. Of course, I can do by hand with post-processing. And then the sparsity constraints are also related to the optimal actuator placement. Let me give a specific situation. The motivation comes from optimal optimization of light sources, locations, light locations, in diffusical optimal tomography. So you would like to, the goal is the homogeneous elimination of this re region omega zero in photochemotherapy by applying light bulbs, if you wish, on the boundary of the domain. Where to put them? Where to put these sources? The model is a more or less an elliptic type equation. Here are the controls on the control domain. You would like to illuminate homogeneously. Here I just draw one light bulb to uh, give sort of a cartoon of this illumination here. Okay? And of course the diffusivity is not a constant, but it's tissue dependent and so on. So you can, when do, in principle you can do it. You, I give you f five light bulbs or 55 light bulbs and as many locations as, as are physiologically meaningful and then we start playing around. But this is from the point of view of complexity it's a tremendous amount of complexity. Every time you have to solve a PDE in the background and to, to compare what's the better result. So there is an issue there when it comes to um, solving this efficiently. Okay, so the typical uh, talk also needs to have a table of contents. Here it is, a little late, but I'm getting there. And I'm not really obeying my table of contents in a, in, in a very strict manner, but here are the keywords. Optimal control with sparsity constraints. And first, I focus simply on elliptic equations to, to, to get a little bit of theory across. But sparsity is one of the keywords that I wanted to bring across. And the second keyword I want to really bring across in this lecture, then I could stop, is that one can compute eventually, these sparse controls, even efficiently by Newton-type techniques, in spite of the non-differentiability which is involved. And then I go to directional sparsity, because you may think I want sparsity only in time or in space, but in the other direction it should be as usual. Then I go to switching control and to multiband control. Next slides are somewhat more technical, admittedly. So I repeat in showing this tracking type problem for an elliptic equation. If you don't feel comfortable with elliptic equation, you may think of A as a matrix or a discrete time system and you have a right hand side, a vector. And then instead of L1 over the domain, which is the integral, you would just have the sum of the coordinates. So this is a, I, I hope it's a nice problem. I have tried to convince you during the first 20 mi minutes that it's important. And now we just write it. And we, as a mathematician, the first thing we do is to see and look whether we can prove existence. And we cannot prove existence. There is no solution. Why not? Well, we are solving in the space of L1 functions. So what's the difficulty? Well, we do the usual thing. Yeah? We, we have up, it's bounded from below. We have an upper bound. Otherwise, it would explode. So we extract the convergent subsequence. And since we're in infinite dimensional spaces, we need to extract a weakly convergent subsequence. And since we are not reflexive space, so we extract a weakly star convergent subsequence. OK, only technical issues. But then we look at L1. And 2L1 in infinite dimensions is not the dual space of any nice Banach space. So we are stuck. 
So really, and this is not a technical issue, it's an, it is an analytical as well as a numerical fact. All right, so we need to, do a, we need to have a remedy. And there are basically choice, two choices which have been followed. In addition, one puts on control constraints, bounds. Why not? L infinity bounds. Then you are in, essentially in L infinity together with the sparsity features. That's one possibility. The formulas get more involved than those which I'm doing next. Or you enlarge the space of control to measures. So in principle, you allow delta functions. Or in higher dimension, you allow line sources or co dimension one sources. All right, so that's what I'm doing here. Um, but if you don't like the measure space, just replace any. Every time you see an M, you replace it by L1. And if you don't like function space, it replace it by little l1, the sum over the coordinates. OK, so this is now. Oh. But in reality, if I'm really having a PDE, now I have measure magnitude controls. And now we have no luck by going to the textbook and looking up what is the regularity of, an, of some PDE if the control is in measures. So re every time, really, we have to study the PDE subject to controls which are in measures. Yeah, that's a technical work. I do it once on one slide only, and then I leave this subject, of all, in spite of the fact that it's a lot of fun. Um, so if you as a measure valued control, pick any Q in this range. The solution of the elliptic PDE is then living. It's still once differentiable in sort of sense, but the power, let's look at the power in dimension three. Ah, it's not square integrable anymore. Three divided by two, three over two. Okay, but you still have some type of solution. And you have an a priori bound as we wish. And later on, we are going to talk a lot about adjoints. And the adjoint is going to live in W1Q prime. Q prime is this object here. So in my toy problem where I said dimension three was three over two, this turns out to be Q, Q prime turns out to be three. So we are still, the adjoint is continuous function. That's nice, at least that. And now next step one has to do is uh, to write down an optimality system and then we start, can start to compute. Now I do this in two steps. First I go back to the square and I write down for us the optimality system. I derive the optimality system and then I replace the square by the L1. And then we see what's happening. In the quadratic case, um, my favorite way of doing it, at least formally, is by writing down, down the Lagrangian. You may think of it as the Hamiltonian and if you take away the integrals. Okay, th so this is the Lagrangian. You see the cost functional, you see the cost functional, you see a Lagrange multiplier or the adjoint state, and you see a y minus u here. And now I take the derivative with respect to p. It, uh, there exists a minimizer, of course, and the minimizers have stars on them. So I have uh, a y star equal u star, fantastic. So I take the derivative with respect to y, and I have uh, y minus z, and I have the adjoint state here, fun, no problem. And then I can take the derivative with respect to u. I forgot, no, I didn't put on the constraints here. So I have alpha times u equal to plus u. I put it to the other side, it's minus p. Fantastic. So good, so far. Now I replace this one. I hope at least. Yes, here it is. Here it is, oops, and I, <laughs> so I didn't replace it here. Sorry, this is L1. Uh, okay, so I take a derivative. Nothing changes in the primal equation. Nothing changes in the adjoint equation. But now here I have to replace, I take the derivative with respect to u. Taking the derivative with respect to u, and he, here it is correct, thanks goodness. Taking the derivative with respect to u. And here is convex analysis in two slides. I mean, two, in, one, in, in half a slide, in two figures, right? Here's the norm function. And what's so useful, and so difficult to understand why it's useful, is con convex conjugates. We have to take it as a fact that in convex analysis, and the norm function is a convex function, the conjugate 
is the indicator function of the set. Now, if this has slope 1, then it's the indicator function of the, of the set minus 1, 1. I mean, it's, ze it's 0, and outside is infinity. So from a norm const constraint, from a Moore function, one goes over to a bilaterally constrained object. Now, if I take the derivative with respect to u here, I take the derivative with respect to u, so the alpha is here, so I have the p star. And since I don't know how to take the derivative of the norm, I just say, write subdifferential of the function phi, which is the norm function. Of course, I know how to do it, but let's just play the game, right? But before I even want to write it down, I recall from convex analysis this relationship. This object this is in the argument of the subdifferential if and only if this same object is related to u star by replacing the original functional by its convex conjugate. This we have to accept. Now we, we un try to understand this object. First, to be in the subdifferential, this has to be in the domain of phi star. So this means that the optimal p star has to be between 1 over alpha, has to be between minus 1 and 1, or rescaled. The optimal p, the optimal p is between minus 1 and 1. And then the other things I just rewrite. So re going from the square to the one, nothing changes in the primal, nothing in the edge joint equations. But the optimality condition, which used to be alpha u equal p, is now a complementarity system. From the numerical point of view, we are in truly in trouble all of a sudden, because I'm going from equation solving to inequality realizations. And inequalities are out front, not so simple. So the price, I started out with sparsity. The price I'm paying now is something which at first sight seems not, not so nice, not so elegant, not ad hoc, not sufficiently cheap for practice, etc. So we need to work on this. And I'll work a couple of slides on that before I go back to sparsity and so on, because I want to somehow develop a machinery, a set of technical tools, where I can not only treat sparsity, but I can also treat switching and other kinds of things. All right, because this is a generic problem. I need to take it seriously. So I repeated this one, just this complementarity system, as it's called, and I realized that in, I can rewrite it in many different ways. For example, I could also say that P star is the projection on this constraint set. That's another way of saying it. And before I do that, I want to take one moment aside and say, I said sparsity, I wrote L1, and by showing you the slides, I made you convinced that we have sparsity. But we, 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 we don't have it yet analytically. You just I tried to get your mind to a sparsity by showing you pictures, but I didn't prove it yet, okay? So there's a difference there. But in fact, we can prove it. Take this function and comp compose it in, we say Jordan decomposition, but com compose it into its positive and its negative branches. So you have a control which is plus minus, you take the positive and the negative one, and the positive on the one side, and now you see where does it have its support? The support is those points where it's different from zero. Where it's different from zero. And in fact, it's related to the adjoint. The adjoint P star, remember, it's between plus alpha and minus alpha. So the support, if the P star is not on one of its boundaries, minus one or the plus alpha, then anyway, U star is zero. So now we have an analytical expression for this type of sparsity. It is related to the sign of the adjoint state. All right, so this justifies also the uh, this sparsity from the mathematical point of view. But now I go back to this complementarity condition, to the inequalities, and I want to rewrite them. I shall rewrite them. 
And if we just play with the signs for a while and do case studies, then it's a very important fact that we can rewrite this complicated thing as a nonlinear equation. C is any number you wish. C can be one. So, for example, if, if P star, if U star is zero, then this can only happen if and so on. You go through this, okay? The whole complementarity system is replaced by this nonlinear equation. So I allow myself to go back one slide. You take this, you take this one, and you just put it in as a third equation. And now you have to solve a nonlinear equation. So we, by quadratic, we had alpha star, alpha u star equal p, and now we have this nonlinear equation. It is a little formal, admittedly, but it can be made rigorous. Now we need to solve this. And now I need to take three minutes of your time to just solving such type of equations where max and min operators are involved. And even if you were not so interested in what I was talking, on, uh, talking so far, now is the time to focus again, because this may appear in other situations. Simply the situation is, you are trying to solve a nonlinear equation with some non-differentiable terms in them. The non-differentiability is not too wild. It's still, you see, Lipsch roughly speaking, Lipschitz. And am I still allowed to do Newton, and can I justify it to some degree? That's the focus. And there is a notion, we call it Newton differentiability. So you take any function from a Banach space X into a Banach set Z, but you may even think of Rn into Rm, sure. Um, and I'm looking for a candidate for a derivative, G like generalized derivative, if you wish. And I'm looking at my differential quotient, the difference quotient, then I take the differential. And you say Mr. Kunish has not done his basics. He's evaluating the generalized derivative, g, at the wrong argument. Rather than evaluating it at x, it's evaluated at x plus h. No, 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 I didn't do it at the wrong. I insist on this. I really insist on it. I insist, insist on this notion and I, then I take the derivative. And without, and I, if such, if this property holds, then I call the function f Newton differentiable at x with generalized derivative g. You can play with the max function in dimension one, and it's nicely differentiable. And what it turns out, if x is positive anyway, the, Derivative is one, if x is negative, anyway, the derivative minus one. At zero, anything you choose does the job. Anything you do does the job. Now, this is really a finite dimensional statement. In infinite dimensions, you take a function, a max function. I take, a, for example, a function of x. I take a function phi of x, and I take maximum pointwise of zero and phi of x. And look at every point and uh, do the same d directional derivative type, type thing. Yeah? And then I get minuses in some region where it's plus, some region where it's minus, some region where I don't know what to do. I used to have a bad conscience a long time ago, but now I know certain situations are Newton differentiable. Whatever I do, I, I will turn out doing well, and I can't justify it in a moment. But I cannot justify it always. There needs to be a topology gap. I need to go from one space into a space which has a little more regularity. That's an infinite dimensional fact. If I start out in L2, I, it's nicely new to differentiable from L2 to L2 minus L2, in 2 to L, in L1. And the generalized derivative is written here. All right. So what's so good about it? What's so good about it is let x star be a root of some nonlinear equation where x star is Newton differential in the neighborhood of this point. 
uh, let's look at the generalized derivatives. If they are uniformly bounded, then Newton iteration converges locally. Not quadratically anymore, as we learned in the textbooks, but superlinearly only. So that's the price we have to pay. All right. And now there is, of course, in the meantime, we have rate of convergence. It has been verified in the literature. There is a calculus for known smoothness. And here are some of the names of people who work to work on it. All right. So now we know this. Now we go back to our optimality system. To do it mathematically correct, since I don't have the topology gap, I discretized here. So this is already a discretization. That's why the ages are there. Then my f from the previous slides is this equation, and I solve it by same as Newton. I just put a Newton on it locally. Globally, maybe we, we need to globalize. So what was the first motivation? Was this homogeneous illumination, right? So I, I, this, now let's, the control domain is the boundary. That's where I put my light bulbs. This is before the optimal control. This was just the motivation for the optimal actuator placement. I, after th this, I want to do with L1. I, once I have my optimal placement, I can do another optimization routine for, and I will use a different cost function. Or maybe I, for that one, I may be using L, L2 or whatever anyway. And here is the region where I want to con con illuminate. And I, this one it should be illuminated homogeneously. So we are tracking to a constant there because it should be homogeneous. And the boundary, con the side constraints are these, um, elliptic equations. And so you see some survive for a certain range of alpha values. We can change alpha, then, few, then they are stronger, but fewer survive. They are along the boundary, and so on. All right, so far John's sparsity. And then next one is directional sparsity. I can go faster now. Now I am replacing the elliptic equation by a parabolic equation. Why dot e minus Laplacian y equal u. I know we should put on control operators, observation operators. That's not the focus here. I insist on some abstract norm, but now I have a choice. I want to play with my sparsity in one direction, in the other direction, and I can start playing with it. I can do it in space time. One possibility. I can do it in space, and afterwards I integrate in time. Let's pass it in space. In a moment, I'm going to write it also in terms of L1, so it's easier to read. But I can change integrations. I can inside, I take a point in X, and I follow the trajectory. And this is in L2. And I do this for all points, and I take their measure. And that's not, that's, that makes a big difference. For example, if I take a point source, but I move it like this. This is not in this space. Rather, the point source to be in this space, so if I put on this constraint or this penalty, it has to move constantly. That's, we are going to make use of it in a moment in practice. So, but in the next slide, I just show these formulas. So the, the order of integration in space and time really makes a big difference. So there is a nice zoology one has to learn. Now, this directional sparsity, that's if, I, if you allow me to go back, this one here, where I said it really makes a difference and it's not allowed to move around. Okay, inverse source problem. We are doing inverse problems on a slide or two. So basically the situation is the following. There's an inflow into a reservoir. There's an outflow. You take measurements at the outflow. There are point sources and I changed my problem setting a little bit, I allow point sources on, in this strip. But I don't tell you where the point sources are. Only I have observations out here. So the setup, the numerical setup for the game we are playing in a moment is the following. I have a point, two point sources. Here they are. And they are on for a while. But then the people who are putting in the garbage, they realize that we are observing and we are working on it. Then they turn off the, uh, the sewage. Yeah? So then it's gone. And we are doing our fantastic uh, inverse problem here. So there's the solution operator S of U. 
there's these point sources in, uh, which are now only in a, a strip, and there's a convection diffusion equation with inflow and outflow, and we are putting on this control constraint. And then we are doing the Newton method for this type. And that's a reasonable situation now, uh, because the point sources should go along, their, their origin is at one point. So this origin at one point, the directional sparsity is really a nice formulation for this, because inverse source problems are notoriously very ill-conditioned. Okay. So here you just see this, the snapshots of the, of the direct problem. So there are the two point sources and the solution of the convection diffusion equation. So no control, just to see you have two sources. This, the, uh, the density goes through the domain. It arrives at the outflow where we observe, and then it's gone. So we use this as our observations. Of course, we put on noise, so not to do an inverse crime. And I have repeated them from the previous slides, and that's what we get numerically. But numerically, the states are always pretty well constructed. Really, I'm not so much worried about the states. I'm worried where the controls are. So remember, this is where the wear, no, remember, this is where the wear, and this is how they looked, and this is our reconstruction. As usual, one loses the height, but at least the sources are well detected. So what I'm saying is sparsity and inverse problems. On the other hand, just um, two other sparsity in space-time, okay. Um, for the numerical experiment in space-time, this is the situation that what we want to track, uh, and that's what we get, the control sources. The controls uh, look like line sources, and in fact, they can be proved to be line sources um, for different ranges of alpha values. Next topic on my table of contents is switching control. Switching control. I go to a somewhat different topic, but I want to use this toolkit that I have learned. The toolkit if I learned, convex analysis techniques are useful. Uh, let's see what else we can do with them. I have a dynamical system, a linear one. The control operator I'm thinking of is a heat equation or something like that. I have control patches in the domain, omega i, some patches. And there are the amplitudes are my controls. The amplitudes are the controls. So they are sitting up there. I have n of these amplitudes. And the name of the game is I would like to have only one active at a time. Only one active at a time. So as of this, right? And I put it on this term. So what is this term? And why is this term any, hopefully any good? So I focus on this term. And you, again, you see a mixture of L2 and L1. So what do I mean? I take the argument, not the integral, I take the argument and I repeat this argument here. What it means is alpha over two, the summation of the coordinates, and then I square it. And then this argument is taken at any moment in time. So u of t afterwards. V is a vector. u is a vector, vector of these coordinates. All right. Now, this, in this way, written in this way, it looks a little atypical. Let's rewrite it. If I rewrite it, it's just my old friend plus these mixing terms. Plus these mixing terms. Okay, what do they penalize? They penalize if two controls simultaneously would like to be active. That's penalized now. All right, so I propose to use this functional. If you don't like it, then you are back in the optimal control setting with squares. But the more of this you take, the more you penalize the two ac active simultaneously. All right, does it do any good? Let's see, a switching control for a competitive Lotka Volterra equation. You have an ODE in the usual uh, setting um, and with the number of predators and preys for the N, the birth rates for the Cs, the interaction rates, um, etc. And then there is a, pr you would like to optimize your profit, 
profit by harvesting, U1 and U2, very classical textbook problem. Textbook problem, you optimize or maximize the profit or minimize the loss, okay, minus negative, okay. But we are putting on this, this term, the square, and the, there's only now two controllers, uh, two harvesting rates, and so I write it like this. Does it do any, just that. And we put it into our semi-smooth Newton solver. And what we get is, for two different types of prices, as a function of time, oh, with that nice, perfect switching. Huh? It, first the one is harvested, then the other is harvested. Now we have a different type of uh, price. The price is oscillating as a function of time, and lo and behold, uh, there's first the one should be harvested, then the other, and the on and so on. So it does an, a nice job, and this is without post, 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 without post processing. Um, uh, maybe I don't go too much into the technical details on this slide, except for the fact that again here we can characterize the switching structure in terms of the in terms of the adjoint. I write the adjoint here. The adjoint has <coughs> been looking at this adjoint, and we can, in fact, characterize the switching. Um, and in fact, we can say, uh, give a sufficient condition on perfect switching, but the switching, this condition is too strong still. I mean, it really use, um, uses analyticity, etc. so it's not an all-purpose all tool. Also, there is lots of difficulties over which I jump here. We need to characterize the subdifferentiable and its conjugate. We need to possibly regularize and so on. It's not. And then this functional, you may say, where is it coming from? This functional, the quadratic and linear term. You can also think of it as the convex com convexification of the functional, which is just the quadratic and the delta function of the situation where two of the controls are active simultaneously. This is a non-convex non function. You convexify it, and then you are there. A second example of this uh, switching situation, switching control, uh, you'll be look at the heat equation. We look at the heat equation. We have an observation region. We have a desired state there. And desired state is a function of time, to, so that we really make use of our switching. So you, something is rotating. And we have seven controllers sitting there. And let's see whether we can have them go around as the uh, desired state goes around. And here the details are what the finite element discretization does. That's not too much. And in fact, first we have n of the controllers. It does well. And they are switching. Um, there's the first controller. Then there is the, this is the first controller. This was the second controller. So you can read off in the colors. And then we take um, seven controllers, it still works. Then we reduce the alpha value. We do reduce the alpha value and it works. We still further reduce the alpha, the control penalty. Now all seven controllers are all of a sudden active. The fact is we cannot use any alpha yet. We cannot go arbitrarily to zero. So we cannot guarantee switching for very, very cheap costs. But at least it gives a good contribution. So I have um, five more minutes. Um, yeah, I take three of them, uh, if, you, if the chairman allows me to. So I make things a little bit more complicated, right? Because we need to go on. The last sentence was, we can reduce the alpha value, but we cannot make it arbitrarily small. I, at the beginning, I so much convinced you from to go from the square to there, to, to at least there looking at the norm. But what I would like to is sometimes really zero. And the, the most, so let's go further. Let's go further. I take the square root. So it's the zero becomes even more pointue, pointed, like more accurate. I mean, in the most accurate way would be x to the power zero. So this is the function, the abstract function. It's one, and then it's zero, and then it's one again. So I do a lot of difficulties. First, there was the difficulty from going square to L1, which was leaving the smooth world. Now I'm leaving the convex world. 
by going to these functions. That's correct. Uh, you say uh, there's a lot of difficulty, numerically and analytically, because there are no more topological tools to, to argue existence. All the weak star nice topology is, is not available in this situation. At least not the infinite dimensions. The finite dimensions, they play an extra role. The LP space has, little LP has really nice things. So uh, for the moment, I am really interested in this X0. I'm excited most about the X0. So let me take a look at it. I'm just playing a game here. I'm taking the square and adding with the zero function. So it's, this one is one all the time except at zero. So I'm looking at this function. So I am doing its convexification. We can all do it together and we'll find this one. Excuse me, this should be a G double. D double. That's the convexification. I have done earlier the convexification, but the convexification I have done earlier from the quadratic, it was has a global effect. Everywhere I added the L1. This one is now a local effect. So there are two of them are different. This is in dimension one. In dimension two, you can think of the same thing. You take the quadratic and you take zero everywhere. You penalize everywhere where V1 is not equal to V2, so along the axis. Oh, you see that there comes, uh, you can spend the whole weekend on characterizing this nicely and then it's subdifferential, right? So it's not so easy, but it can be done. Is there any use in it? Ah, that's where multibang. I, I use it. I use it for multibang. I do a optimal control, and you have three favorite controllers. No, you have N, D, D favorite control settings, because yesterday you were the pilot only wants to do, use three gears, right? Or the car only wants to use three gears. You have three favorite ones, and I put them there, one of the three has to be chosen by this functional, or is at least favored by this functional. All right? The product of these guys. It, I would like it to be zero, then it's the smallest. So it, U has to be one of the three. And I put also, since I am only where I have to be between the smallest and the largest, I put on control constraints. So I cannot solve it. So I convexify it in the way I have indicated it on the previous slide. And um, then before we do computations, we, we need to prove something at least. And they, does the multiplying admit the solution? And in some sense, it's even accurate. If this penalty parameter beta compared to alpha is sufficiently large, then the optimal control is either on one of these UIs, on desired, or Y star is equal to the desired state. Then I cannot do any better. And, but then I this is convexified problem. We can also estimate the duality gap, but this is somewhat implicit, so I don't give the details. And then we can play numerically. I have some desired state. And these are the controls. You can guess what my desired controls were, right? Uh, zero, one, and two, and here I had zero, one, and two, and some minus one. So it works pretty neatly. Of course, we are continuing. Um, we are continuing on this, and we also want to clo solve closed loop problems. And here I'm doing what one really should not and never do. I should never do, but I, anyway, I don't follow my outline always. I don't follow my other rules always. So I don't follow this rule either to show what has been finished a couple of days ago, or just very recently. Uh, I do that, and we are looking, oh, excuse me, um, we are looking at a very simple closed loop situation. Uh, it's just the iconal equation in two dimensions has two coordinates, y1 of t, y1 of t, y2 of t equal to some control, and y0 is zero, and we are doing the infinite horizon problem, but with different values for p, with different values for p. The optimal value function assigns the optimal value as a function of the initial condition. This is the p is equal to two. L2 controls, the smooth optimal value functions, as usual. Sure. But if there are no control and state constraints, sure. And now I have one for the value function. You see something Lipschitzian-ness coming out, and then there's one half, and it's one half. 
And the L2 controls, they do what I want, right? They become more and more sparse and more, uh, in this space, in this case, uh, temporal situations for these two controls. So with that, um, I conclude. I was talking about convex analysis techniques. They are a powerful tool to handle non-smooth cost functionals. The necessary optimality conditions, which, one, which need to be solved, can be handled if one is not shying away from semi-smooth Newton techniques. Of course, the analysis needs to be improved in many directions over what we have now. Of course, there are interesting other control theoretic aspects, like combining this, what I've done, with controllability issues, with uh, stabilization, stabilizability issues, stabilize, is this pass controls are sufficient, or switching controls? I know that, of course, in the switching community, um, switched systems have a long history, on especially uh, with respect to stabilization. I need to look, we need to look further into implications, and there is the never-ending story of how to choose alpha. We have some comments on that, but this is... And then there are some contributors, which I have not mentioned so far. Of course, with respect to sparsity, uh, there are other approaches, most notably the relaxation technique with followed by rounding error techniques by Hante and Saga, and many people who have contributed from the point of view that I was alluding to. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I finish roughly on time. Thank you. It's us who are thanking you for a very stimulating talk that gives a lot of insights into uh, optimal control problems and introducing a lot of new concepts. Um, he indicated that he's very willing to answer questions, but we decided not to allow any from the plenum here. Um, so if anybody has questions, please come forward after the talk and uh, comments, questions are very much welcome. So thanks again, Professor Kunisch, for your interesting contribution. <laughs>